Now, before I explain my profession, let me tell you the truth. There are monsters in the world, and they're almost all out for your blood. Luckily, there are people to keep them at bay. I am one of those people. Now, I'm long retired for 15 years, but I've seen my fair share of blood, guts, demonic possession, and things with more teeth than normal. So, I'm here to give you an idea of all the stuff that I've encountered. Okay, let's start with the basics. My dad was a cryptid hunter. The top of his class, actually. He has probably seen way more than I have. He specialized in long-range type missions, many of which occurred in forested areas. But he also tackled some more close-range, for lack of a better word, missions. He's killed things from ancient werewolves worshipped by Indians to the mighty Mothman of Point Pleasant. He's tough. But the things he couldn't kill were known as specialized cases. These were monsters that had brains, or hadn't done anything wrong at that point, or monsters that the government just wanted them to be kept alive for one reason or another. One of these cases was a girl named Emily, but we'll get to her later. For now, let's talk about my stories of woe. My name is Tom, I'm 36. I was chosen for this job because of my connection with the military, combined with my dad's friends knowing me. I was in. But questionable hiring aside, my first case was simple. A chupacabra had been killing sheep and attacked a farmer. We were worried that it might develop a taste for human flesh. So, they sent me to a ranch in the middle of nowhere, Mexico. Now, chupacabra are a bitch to catch, but they're a walk in the park compared to some other cryptids. It required a weird cycle of putting out half-rotted sheep meat and waiting. I repeated this for days, but finally it came. I first saw it sniffing the fly-covered sheep meat, and I readied my sniper rifle. Just as I was about to pull the trigger, it saw me, and it leaped almost directly out on top of me. It had at least jumped a good 20 feet forwards and 10 feet high. It clawed my arm up, but I grabbed my trench knife and I sunk it into the beast's left shoulder. It recoiled and roared in agony. Less of a roar. More of a human scream mixed with a cougar. I drew a shotgun out from my backpack that I carried, and I blew its head off. I got it, wrapped my bloody arm in bandages, and loaded the corpse into my car, and it drove away. When I got back, it was discovered that other hunters had caught another cryptid. A girl named Emily. Emily looked for what I could tell, completely human. But she had something that was up with her. Despite looking 8 years old max, Black long hair, brown eyes. She could solve math problems near instantly. Like I'm talking 7 digit number multiplication in at most 2 seconds. She talked like she was in a professional meeting with the president of the US. She appeared to have no feelings besides hatred. I was tasked with guarding the interviewer in a cell. The conversation goes as followed. Good evening, Emily. Good evening, sir. You need anything before we continue? No, sir. I'm fine. What do you feel right now? What do you see? I see everything. I see the fear in your eyes. I see the clock ticking to 10.50 p.m. And I see the evil in him. She points at me. Okay. What do you feel? Must I really answer that when I've taken thousands of lives because of it? This girl had killed over 2,000 people before we captured her, and I was in the same room with this monster. But she still looked completely human, and when I noticed her eyes... Her eyes weren't normal. They seemed to look normal one second, but then expanded into nothing but a black void the other second. Eyes of hatred. Eyes of a desire to kill everyone and everything. And then she grew. She went from an 8 year old to my age, 21, in an instant. My grip on my handgun tightened. Sir, please step out of the room. I don't want to hurt someone like you. Wait, don't leave, the interviewer said. His plea was silenced when Emily lunged for the seat. She drew a small knife from one of her boots that she was wearing and plunged it into the man's eye socket. He screamed and I fired my gun. 
It hit her point blank in the side, but she shook it off. I bolted out of there, shutting the door and securing the three locks on the door, and I alerted the guards. My boss came. He said that because of how dangerous Emily is, they can't risk any more people. So, they left the men there and gave me my next mission. My next mission was to find a cryptid known only as Codename Pale. Codename Pale is a 10-foot pale being with no defining features on its face, save a big bloodshot eye in the center. Its agenda is mostly unknown, and what is known is classified information. But what differs it from other cryptids is that it has the uncanny ability to read the mind of its victims, understand the human mind, and it even learned sign language apparently when it escaped. So, I get in my car, find the coordinates of where it was last spotted, this time being somewhere in Arizona, and I haul ass to the spot. The thing was still there sitting on a tree stump, waiting. I snuck through the bushes, loaded my shotgun and took aim. I know you want to kill me, Tom. I know you're there. Come out of your spot. The voice. God, the voice. It sounded like a man speaking through a microphone. It echoed when there is no possible way for it to echo. I spoke. You know that I'm here to kill you. You pick up hints when you're sitting on a tree stump, enjoying the Arizona night. And then someone in a loud ass truck hauling ass up the hill towards you gets out with a shotgun and hides in the bushes. He was joking around. He knew where on the map he was. He knew what cars and guns are. He could swear. This pale was no ordinary cryptid. He knew his way. He understood the concept of human interaction. I questioned him. How did you understand that you were going to die? and joke about it all while staring death in the face. My friend, you are not death. But you're going to die by my hand. Doesn't that make me death in this situation? Neither of us are death. Death is its own thing. Think of death as a disease that slowly eats away at your life. You can either spread it, or keep it for yourself. Either way, you and I are going to die. Those who are affected by death are not death itself. But you're going to die. Death spreads death. The Grim Reaper spreads death and therefore is death. If the act of spreading death makes you death, I am death. Those who are affected by death are not death itself. Sorry, Pale. This talk was fun, but it's time to go. Very well. This entity was quite the Aristotle. I took aim and I shot him in the chest. Pale went down. I got him and I drove him back to my headquarters and was given my next mission the next week. This mission was to find a Bigfoot. Yes, a Bigfoot, not the Bigfoot. That killed at least 200 people in a forest in Canada. I flew there and after a week, found my perfect spot near a big ass cave near where the sightings were most frequent. I waited days, surviving off granola bars and water. But I saw him walk out of a cave on a Tuesday afternoon. I was munching on my 50th granola bar of that day. He noticed me in the bushes. The last thing I saw before bolting for better cover was a good 500 pound boulder barreling towards me. I basically jumped from my spot into a thicket of trees and began running. You would believe that he would be somewhat affected by the trees and to that, I envy you. As I was dodging trees and getting ripped up by thorn bushes, he was smashing through them and doing crotch shots that would make even my dad weep in pain. I spun around quickly and fired a shot with my sniper rifle. It sliced through his left shoulder, drawing blood. But he slammed me into the side with his long monkey arms. I crashed through at least 20 feet worth of trees. I slammed into the ground with a sickening crunch as my ribs cracked. By the time I was up, he was running at me again. I knew that I can't outrun him. I drew my knife and I rushed him, sinking it into his side. He roared in rage and agony. I put my sniper rifle to his head and I fired. The beast fell. He was 8 feet tall, so when he fell, he rumbled the ground a bit. And like always, 
I packed him into my car and I drove away. After I got him to my boss, I got a strange request from the guards that guard the cells that contain the specialized cases. It was a note from Emily. She said that she wanted me moved to that guard duty. Naturally, it was sent right to me before anything bad happened. I walked to Emily's cell. She greeted me with a hello and I repeated the greeting. She asked though that I was in the room with her, heavily guarded of course. She spoke. You know how I said that you're evil? The only evil person in here is you. Cold, direct, and correct. I'm impressed. Why did you bring me here? Quite simple. I brought you here so that I can show you one of my abilities other than shapeshifting. Is that a monster's way of flirting? Negative. I'm here to say that I have more abilities. All of a sudden, one of the guard's heads exploded out of nowhere. Jesus Christ, what the hell was that? It was not of my doing. Look. I turned around and saw a horrifying sight. The guard had been shot. Soldiers were raiding the area. What? He's dead. What do we do? I suggest that we make a run for it, even though I can hold my own. I don't want a person like you to die. Okay, but stay the hell close. I don't want you to go around killing people. And so here I was, sneaking my way through a monster prison with a girl that killed almost 2,000 people right behind me. All while military personnel are raiding the building. This couldn't get any worse, can it? Well, as it goes, it did. We were in the second wing of the building, only one wing away from the exit, when a mothman jumped me. It bit down hard on my shoulder, causing me to shriek in pain. I drew my knife and I shoved the blade into its torso. It screamed and got off me, before crashing through a glass cell holding a goat man, which proceeded to charge out of instinct, straight into Emily's path. Before I could speak, the goat man, or what was left of him, was splattered against the wall. Emily stood there, holding a nearby pair of scissors. It took me a while to realize that what was splattered against the wall was its brain. Emily had gutted the poor thing like a fish, and had enough time to perform extreme brain surgery. I got up. Nice job, I said. After that, we booked it to the exit. Now came the hard part. What to do with Emily? She didn't seem like the cold monster she was in the facility. She was glad, happy even, to be in the outside world. Yeah, five seconds ago, she gutted a goat man faster than a ninja in an anime could slice something midair. When I questioned her about it later, she said that she was the last surviving subject of a failed attempt to make a super soldier. Think, a soldier with the highest rank in military, experience with guns, knowing almost every form of martial arts, and with the speed and agility of a methed up chipmunk. Now, multiply that by 100, give them shape-shifting abilities, and you get close to Emily's capabilities. It turns out she means well, has an IQ of almost 200, and can tell if someone asking her questions is a spy. She had been hunted down by the military since she had escaped the facility at 8 years old, and the highest kill count. It's all military personnel. The monster hunters had to capture her so that the public wouldn't find out about her backstory. It's pretty cool. Also, she was cool with the facility keeping her, although she said it could get a bit stuffy, all in that cold, matter-of-fact tone. Cut it to two months later, me, Emily, and my best friend, turned monster hunter Josh, were in the Alaskan wilderness tracking down a yeti. And before you ask, yes, there's a difference between a Bigfoot and a Yeti. For starters, a Yeti is much taller, like a Bigfoot can only be 8 feet tall. However, there are reports of Yetis becoming a staggering 26 feet in height. So, needless to say, we asked for some heavy duty tools. The next difference is their behavior. While Bigfoot only attacks when provoked or their territory is invaded, Yetis could wipe out an entire village without even waking up on the wrong side of the rock bed. So, we were tracking this thing down in the snow. I was scouting out the area when Josh asked. So, Tom, 
Uh, how's Emily? Just as murderous as always. Josh being the shit-talking douche he is. I've been seeing you two exchanging glances. Remember, Josh, you're not the one here with the high-powered sniper rifle. Oh, come on, man. It was just a prank. Me, also knowing Josh loves pranks that cause a lot of damage. You said that when you egged my car. I'll fucking do it again. Our banter was cut short via a roar so loud it seemed to rumble the ground beneath our feet. Followed by a tree hurling towards us like a wooden torpedo. I heard Emily scream. Get down! As it crashed into the ground, nearly connecting with my head. And then silence. I sat up and I looked through the scope of my rifle. I saw the Yeti crashing through the trees making a beeline for us. I fired a shot, which whistled through the air and hit the beast in the kneecap. It roared in pain but it kept its pace. We slid down into a frozen creek and kept low. Josh was breathing heavily but kept his cool somehow. I was keeping a straight face, something that I'm really good at. Hell, the other hunters gave me the nickname Poker Face for that reason. Emily was the same, but less relaxed than me. She was gripping her shotgun tightly. I held my breath. The monster was right where we wanted it. I hesitated. The Yeti was sniffing around, getting increasingly closer to our position. Suddenly, it grabbed Josh and swung him into a tree. The crack of Josh hitting the tree is in my mind forever. Emily shot him in the chest, ran up to the rock and jumped from it, and nailed the 19-foot behemoth in the head with a well-placed tornado kick, but it slammed her into the ground. I fired again. It sliced through the side of his neck. He saw where the bullet came from and nearly pulverized me with his hand. I rolled out of the way just in time, but he backhanded me into a tree. The sickening feeling of my ribs cracking almost made me throw up. The Yeti walked up, picked me up by my head and sat. The beast could crack my skull like an overripe blueberry. I stopped moving, body frozen in fear. When Josh fished out the Molotov cocktails in his pack and tossed one to the Yeti, it went up in flames, screaming. It dropped me into the creek, breaking the ice, causing my poor back to come into contact with freezing water and the rocky bottom of the creek at the same time. The monster crashed to the ground, a burning turd of what it once was. Still wallowing in pain, I opened my eyes to see Emily. She was staring at me pale. Are you okay, Tom? She said. I nearly jumped if it wasn't from the pain. She had asked a question with genuine concern for my safety. This is not the Emily I once knew. I just sat there looking. What? Are you in too much pain to speak? She said. I snapped back to reality and said, No, I'm just surprised you asked me that. But deep, deep down, her question confused me. Not for the actual question itself, but how she said it. After informing my boss about the situation, he said that I should get well soon. A pretty mundane type of response. But knowing my boss and his love for underlying meanings, I pressured him about it. He said this, there's another cryptid in Alaska. Is it another Yeti? No, it's something way worse. Okay, like how worse? It's a Wendigo. A Wendigo in Alaska. The perfect bitch slap of fate to the room of my day. If you didn't know, Wendigos are some of the most deadly cryptids out there. They're fast, mean, and don't go down without a fight. How do I know this? My dad was tasked with killing a baby version of these bastards. Only about six feet tall, three times smaller than an adult, and it almost killed him. He was able to give it a lethal dose of cyanide, via the Wendigo killers. Wendigos eat almost anything, so it would eat a bottle filled with weird liquid by shoving it in its mouth and pumping three slugs into the beast's brain. And that was only a baby. Okay, so it turns out that there wasn't just us hunting this thing down. Three other people were sent to go with us to hunt this thing. We were in a military-esque car driving through the forest of Alaska, on the outskirts of a small village. I was riding shotgun. A hunter named Mike was driving. Emily and Josh were in the second row of seats, 
and two other hunters, Jaden and Bob, were riding in third row. You know what a Wendigo looks like, Mike said. Uh, I've seen them in a manual. Don't worry, you'll know. Deer-like head, very thin, roughly a six meters. Very scruffy fur that hangs from its body. It sounds a lot like a skinwalker. Yeah, they're pretty similar. But a skinwalker is a calm, calculating hunter with an attitude. As well as shape-shifting abilities that evolve from corrupted shamans. A wendigo is cannibalistic. A savage beast with an attitude that evolves from some twat eating human flesh. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We were driving at a normal pace when Mike stopped. Hey, why did the car stop? Said Josh. Mike slowly pointed in front of him. We all looked, and we froze with him. There seemed to be what looked like a mangled deer carcass sitting straight up. One issue, however, it was too big to be a deer. Slowly, it rose up from its crouching position. Its arms hung low to its knees. Its fur was snarled and scruffy. Its horns were caked with blood, along with the beast's snout, hands, and its feet. We had just interrupted a wendigo midway through a snack. The person was still moaning, and occasionally convulsing on the ground. The wendigo's eyes adjusted to the light, and a wide, toothy smile slowly came up upon its face. It licked its lips, and it got ready to pounce. Just as the wendigo was about to jump onto the car, Mike gunned it, slamming straight into the beast's body. The wendigo rolled over the car, its bones creating a stomach-turning squeaking noise as it did. We left it in the dust, supposedly. Five seconds later, it was bounding towards the car, roaring. I stuck my head out of the window and fired my AR. Several rounds tore through the beast's skin, but it just screeched and continued bounding after us. Josh dropped one of his cocktails, lighting up the ground behind us. The Wendigo leaped over the 12-foot high flames and was able to slash the back tire of our car. Okay, this isn't a part of the plan, right? No, it's not. I got a double-action shotgun. It could do some damage. Right. What do we need to do so you'll be able to hit it? I gotta get close. I can help with that. What can she do that we can't? You'll be surprised, Mike. Okay, fine. Just get this damn thing off my tail. Jaden leaned out of the car. I readied my assault rifle for another barrage of bullets to be sent the Wendigo's way. Emily drew a barbed wire whip. I watched with wide eyes as Emily snagged the Wendigo's right leg. It fell and got dragged. Still roaring and slashing, the Wendigo batted Emily off. Emily got tangled in the barb and almost fell on top of the monster. I grabbed a part of the whip. My hand got snagged in the barb. I bared through the pain and pulled Emily and the Wendigo closer to the truck. Jaden took aim. But out of nowhere, the Wendigo slashed another tire. The truck spun out and it crashed. I remember waking up. I crawled out of the mangle of metal that was once a truck. I dragged Josh, Mike, Jaden, and Bob out. One person missing though. Emily. I got to her. Her torso was cut up by the barbs. Her breathing was labored and she was bleeding. I got her out. When all of a sudden, the Wendigo jumped out. Jaden pumped a slug into its left eye socket, destroying most of its head. It roared in pain, but it batted Jaden away. Mike shot it in the stomach with his revolver. It once again batted him away. Bob shot it with his crossbow, but he got slashed away. While we were in bad shape, the Wendigo was dying. Its breathing was fast and shallow. Its body was riddled with burns, gunshot wounds, and arrows. Finally, it dropped, its breathing becoming even more fast and labored. Josh grabbed one of his Molotov cocktails and shoved it into his mouth. The beast gulped and it exploded. Its chest burst from the pressure and flames. It screamed, but its screams were different, sounding more human than normal. After watching the light show that that was, I went to care for Emily. I gently unwrapped the barb, bandaged her up, and made sure that she drank some water. The Wendigo was still breathing, but it was fading. We all gathered around and watched the monster. 
To think that this was once a human, it was chilling. A person resorting to the most extreme and desperate measures in order to survive. Mike handed me his revolver. I nodded. I knew what to do. I limped up to the heaving beast, just barely clinging onto life, and put a bullet into its head. But as its eyes slowly closed shut, I saw its eyes shift from rage to confusion, to realization, to panic and to denial. Every single human emotion in its most raw and desperate form flashed through its eyes, something that I've always ignored because I was too busy thinking about the rush killing these things gave me. And finally, its eyes turned into acceptance, and then blank. In the final moments of its life, the Wendigo had found out that it was going to die, felt every emotion from anger to guilt about all the people that it had killed, and died accepting that it was going to die a monster in the eyes of everyone it ever knew and loved. And to be that desperate to accept and come to a conclusion like that, I couldn't handle it. I burst into tears, sobbing, screaming. I dropped to my knees. This monster found peace at the final moments of its life and knew full well that it was the last time it would ever feel those feelings. I started crying even harder. Everyone else wasn't doing very well either. They had all picked up on the signals about the poor Wendigo. Jaden was in shock. Bob was in a similar state. Josh was crying with me. But the worst was Mike's and Emily's expressions. Mike was a 65-year-old battle-hardened hunter, and he had tears running down his face. But Emily, the same age as me, she was the worst to look at. While everyone else was not trying to hide their emotions, Emily was trying her absolute hardest. She was nearly choking from her attempts to hold in her sadness, but it broke into these guttural, painful sobs. Emily, the coldest person that I know, was crying along with everyone else. But something inside of her changed that night, as if she knew all the pain that she had caused. She walked up and she hugged me tightly. Everything will be alright, she said, and she kissed my forehead. By the time I had really come to realize what had happened, I was still sobbing. But I got up, walked Emily with everyone else to the mangled thing that was supposed to be a car and questioned her about it on our way back. Why did you kiss me? Well, my entire life was filled with hatred. I hated everyone and everything. But when you got me out of that facility instead of leaving me alone, something clicked. I knew what it was like to love. Cut forward to now. Emily and I are happily married. Josh is a chemist. Mike is a happy, healthy 80-year-old coot. And he lives in a nursing home that Emily and I occasionally visit. Jaden is my age and is an engineer. Bob is also about 11 years older than me and he's in IT. Emily is a therapist for a big company and I'm a zoologist studying species of animals. Things are going great. I hope you enjoyed my story. But I gotta go. I gotta feed my cat.